Good morning. So my name is Hua Hai Yang, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a closure fusion of uh, symbolic and data-driven artificial intelligence. So I was trained academically as a psychologist. So, but I also worked as a computer scientist at places like IBM Research and IBM Watson. So now I'm a co-founder of a company called Juji. So what does Juji do? Uh, Juji built chatbot platforms. So where organizations can create chatbot to talk with their audiences. So if you have done it before, you will know how hard it is to build a chatbot that actually can talk like a human. And some may argue that uh, you really need uh, AGI, artificial general intelligence, to do that. Or at least you need to pass the Turing test. You know, the test where uh, a machine is uh, considered as uh, passed the Turing test when uh, humans cannot tell if he's, if he's talking with, uh, with a machine or with a real human. So actually, Turing test has been long past uh, many years ago. Um, Perry uh, is a chatbot that was developed by a Stanford a psychiatrist, um, has passed that in 1972. So this is a kind of a chat, a sample chat that uh, Perry did. So Perry basically simulates a, a paranoid patient. So it has a mental model that tracks uh, states such as anger and uh, fears and such. So it will talk differently based on its internal model. So a panel of 33 psychiatrists can only tell this is a machine from a real patient only at 48% uh, of the time, so actually at the chance level. So that means uh, uh, Perry passed Turing test. The lesson here is that uh, if you have a consistent and reasonable mental model, it actually is not so hard to build something that uh, actually talks like a human. So at Juji, so we also uh, build a chatbot, um, but uh, we feel that actually it's harder to build a chatbot that actually does something that's useful for people. So this, this is uh, actually what uh, Juji's chatbot does. And, uh, Juji chatbots all have an agenda, so I have a purpose. So for example, here we, have, we show you some example of uh, conversation uh, with a gamer. Uh, this is after uh, the chatbot already shows the, the gamer some, some gaming trailers. So this is to collect data for, for one of our marketing research customer. As you can see, this, this boat, in addition to uh, be able to collect feedbacks from, from user about these game trailers. They're also collecting information about uh, the, the gamer's preferences and other information so that uh, we can do an analysis on those information. And also you can say the, the boat doesn't really uh, give up easily. So if, if the user say, okay, I don't have a favorite, so the, the chatbot will prompt and try to get more information out of the, the user. So there are many other use cases for this kind of chatbot. So Juji has deployed chatbot for, uh, in addition to interview people, we can also uh, you can receive uh, uh, as a kind of online receptionist to receive visitors to your website. And uh, also have used it for screen job candidates. Um, some other companies use it to check up on their trainees. So, so if you use it for, for survey people, actually we conduct uh, formal studies to compare with uh, like form-based survey. So uh, Juji Chatbot has uh, kind of double the completion rate and also has much higher quality in terms of uh, inf informativeness of the responses you get from those people. So more importantly, actually people feel this is really fun experience. So some people say feel like this is a friend for them and uh, <laughs> they really like it. So we are able to do this, um, do this long travel tasks uh, because we, we took a very unique approach to approach to build practical AI. Uh, we, take, we took a hybrid approach. So basically we integrate the so-called traditional AI, uh, sometimes called the symbolic AI, and integrate well with uh, so-called data-driven AI, 
most need nowadays is uh, machine learning and deep learning based. So where we use uh, symbolic AI as a kind of bones and the data driven component as a flash. So I will talk more details about how, what that means. And all this is done in a clear DSL. So this is what uh, the DSL looks like. And I will get into details of explanation. So this DSL is called RAP, uh, Responsible Empathetic Persona. Before we dive into this language, and uh, let's step back, and uh, I will give you some intuitions how and why uh, we choose this approach to develop AI. So we all know that uh, AI summary is back. Um, if you have no, we have experienced several episodes of uh, AI winter. And for example, uh, AI is now in the news almost daily. So we have news such as uh, Watson, Jeopardy, Beats Human, AlphaGo, Beats uh, World Champion in Go. And we, we already use, are use, using AI assistants, like Sarah's in your phones and in your home, you have a lot of uh, assistants. And also as a, a lot of uh, companies uh, building commercial products uh, of AI. So all, most of those uh, AI applications uh, uh, is riding on the success of the deep learning uh, approach. So basically deep learning are those uh, neural networks that have many hidden layers. So deep learning have revolutionized uh, image processing, computer vision, and uh, has many, many uh, applications and people can even use deep learning to create uh, uh, digital arts. So in many people's mind, uh, AI basically means deep learning. So, um, so AI is all about deep learning. So we want to do some critical assessment. OK, is that true? So is um, uh, deep learning is really AI? And uh, so in the big scheme of things of AI, where does uh, deep learning fit? So it's. Um, uh, in my opinion, and of course in some other people also share the opinion that uh, uh, what the deep learning does is actually solving the perception problem. So what is perception? So perception is the organization, identification, and the interpretation of uh, sensory information. So in order to represent and understand the presented information or the environment. So that's the definition. So that's precisely actually describe what uh, deep learning does. Basically deep learning takes the raw sensory input such as uh, pixels, uh, text characters, the raw data, and, and turn them into uh, some known labels, uh, also known as classification. Or you, you turn them into some range of some numbers, those uh, regression. Or sometimes you want to kind of normalize it into some kind of a smaller space, uh, uh, turn them into fixed uh, length vectors. Those are called the embedding. So all those are actually are perceptual tasks. And of course, perception often feels like intelligence. So people confuse perception with intelligence because many kind of intellectual tasks can be solved as a percep perceptual tasks, and surprisingly. And for example, playing chess, normally people consider that uh, you need a lot of intelligence, right? You have to really think a, a lot of steps ahead of time, and you need logical reasoning and all that. Um, but that's not how chess masters solve the problem. So they, uh, they actually turn the problem into a perceptual problem. So for example, uh, Capablanca, many consider as uh, kind of a, the best uh, chess player of all time. And when asked about uh, how many steps uh, do you consider when you make a chess move, uh, uh, how many steps ahead are you thinking? So actually has replied only one. <laughs> so, uh, and also, that's always the right one. That means uh, he, he's not likely doing a lot of reasoning or, or things like that. I mean, it's all about pattern recognition and just trigger a certain moves. So that's why they can play with many people at the same time. So, uh, so here you also have a picture of him playing with 30 people. And here on the right, you have a picture of uh, Bobby Fisher. He's playing with 50 people at the same, in the room at the same time. So he just walks through the room and look at the board and the, make a move and then you go to the next, uh, next board. So almost make the move immediately. So there's no reasoning involved. So mostly it's just pattern recognition. <laughs> so this is actually how AlphaGo solves the uh, Go problem. 
and uh, they, they actually don't do, at the beginning they have search then afterwards actually they remove the search part and actually perform equally well <laughs> or a little bit less but they still perform very well so basically uh, they turned this uh, search problem into a perceptual problem and uh, through extensive training of course not all the uh, intellectual tasks can be solved uh, as a perceptual problem um, so if you would look at any textbooks on cognitive psychology, which is basically study how brain works, and the perception is only one of the chapters among many chapters. The chapters talk about uh, attention, memories, mental models, knowledge representation, problem solving, and the list goes on. So those are all a part of the human intelligence. So that. So most of those uh, uh, mental process uh, listed above uh, cannot be solved uh, with just data-driven approach. So a data-driven approach basically is a button-up process where there's all sensory information such as light, sound, uh, enters into, uh, from the environment into the sensory organ and then through some processes and reaches the brain turns into a perception. So the, this process itself is not accessible for human conscience, that's why um, we call them sub-symbolic. So symbolic basically means it is human readable. So most of the process is not uh, human, it's not in your conscience. And so that's why we call them a, a kind of a bottom-up sub-symbolic process. But uh, um, bottom-up process itself alone cannot really so fully solve the intelligence problem. In fact, more than 90% of information that you actually uh, received on your sensory organs actually get lost uh, before actually it reaches the, the brain. So what the brain constantly does is to make hypotheses, basically makes guesses, okay, what I'm saying. Um, so this, this process is entirely driven by the prior ex experience of, of, of the brain, what I've experienced before and what uh, uh, I've have, have seen before. And all those uh, kind of top-down, goal-driven or hypothesis-driven process is what actually the so-called traditional AI was, was all about. Um, because they are dealing with those information that is actually human understandable, so human concepts. So that means in order to solve this artificial intelligence problem, we actually need both uh, bottom-up process where you get data and a top-down process where you have goals, hypotheses. So with the rise of deep learning, so uh, we may say that the bottom-up process or the perceptual problem is kind of semi-solved. And also some people argue that it's still not completely solved because uh, what the machine learning or deep learning learned, this kind of representation is uh, maybe not of the same nature as what the actually brain learned. Um, but uh, for many use cases, we consider that's good enough. So we consider the, the perceptual problem actually semi-solved. That actually, with that, you have much better kind of solid foundation to build up a symbolic system. That's why we think uh, it's my opinion that actually it's a time to bring back the symbolic AI. Um, so the most successful kind of symbolic AI in the past we did was uh, expert systems, right? So expert systems are basically a networks of uh, production rules. So what is production rules? Basically it's an if-then statement. Um, so it's basically a large graph of those uh, rules. So many of those uh, symbolic AI systems can be helped with kind of, a, can be also be turned into a graph search problems. And, and which happen to be the same kind of problem that can be helped by like a, um, GPU hardware, because you, a gra any graph search problem can, can be turned into a matrix multiplication. And that you can use the same thing that is driving deep learning to drive uh, symbolic AI. So, and also we have uh, much better, more abundant realistic data that can help uh, construct this kind of knowledge base that uh, symbolic AI needs. And finally, we have much better software tools than before. And uh, for example, uh, most of the symbolic system was traditionally built with NISP. So now we have uh, modern NISP, like the like Clojure. So that really makes this uh, process much easier than before. So there, of course, there are some trade-offs between uh, symbolic AI and uh, uh, sub-symbolic AI. 
so the data, the weakness of a data-driven approach is that it's entirely driven by data. So that what if somebody gave you bad data? So it's very really easy to kind of uh, defeat or abuse um, uh, data-driven system if you have some uh, malicious actors. So for example, um, here you have a, have a panda, so with 57% confidence, this is a panda, the system, but if you add some lawyers, well-constructed lawyers, and it will, the system will have 99% confidence saying, okay, this is a, a gibbon. So, but the, this is actually a gibbon looks like. So, <laughs> so human will never make this kind of mistake, but a, a deep learning system can be easily fooled to, uh, just by adding some noises that is human undetectable, and, but the system will fail. So, um, so that's kind of weakness of the entirely data-driven system. Uh, in the chatbot uh, world, the, another example is uh, the Microsoft released this uh, chatbot um, maybe last year, um, a few years ago. It's called Tay. So within 24 hours, this uh, boat was taken down because it's starting to talk uh, like hate speeches because there are some malicious people, users, just fed them <laughs> some bad data and, <laughs> and starting to talk in uh, uh, hate speech, so it has to be taken down. So as you can see, if your system is purely driven by data, so it is easily, easily abused. And also it's very hard to debug this kind of system because all of them, all can, you can see is uh, just a bunch of matrices, so there's not much, not much you can do. So it's <laughs> uh, so very hard to, to to let the system do what you want it to do, because uh, the system is not, is obscure, it's a black box. So that's the weakness of the data-driven systems. Um, those problems that I, I mentioned uh, actually is by design, because the system is, is driven by data, so it's by design. Um, it has to be, the only way to influence the system is through data, so that's, uh, those problems is very unlikely to be fixable without some help from the symbolic uh, component or symbolic systems. So on, on the other hand, so the purely symbolic uh, system are often very br br brutal. So it's very easy to make some catastrophic mistakes um, because everything is sort of burning, or basically, or laughing. Um, and also very difficult to develop because uh, humans are not used to think like a machine. So humans are never lo very logic, and all, it's not very consistent in their mind. So it's really hard for people to develop this kind of system because you you, you have to think like a like a machine to be able to to do well uh, to, to to build a good symbolic system. So also, of course, in principle, if you have really good developers, they really kind of train themselves to think like a machine. Yes, maybe they can do well. And so, in principle, those problems can be solved. But uh, in practice, actually, that's how uh, the traditional AI in the past actually failed to realize their potentials, um, because in practice it's very really difficult. That's why we need to kind of combine those two, two approach together. So, so there are basically two ways to combine uh, symbolic system and sub symbolic systems. So one way, uh, as actually most people has tried, is to implement symbolic, uh, this symbolic phenomena, such as kind of reasonings, uh, uh, attentions, et cetera in sub-symbolic system, in, for example, neural networks. So this is uh, actually ever since uh, in 1950s, people discovered that you actually can implement a uh, finite state machine with neural, neural networks. People have been starting to work on this problem for like half a century continuously. I consider the current uh, uh, efforts in deep learning community to try to implement the reasoning with neural networks. It belongs to the same kind of uh, uh, research traditions. And the problem with this, this approach, of course, this approach is very attractive because it's, this sounds like the way brain solves the problem, right? Brain, in the end of the day, you can consider it's a, it's a huge network. And uh, emerge from that, you got, uh, you got the memories, you got the reasonings. So it sounds like uh, is the right way to do this. Um, but the problem is uh, after like, more than half century of efforts, we have not uh, actually uh, produced anything that's practical with this approach. And, and in my opinion, uh, in the near future, I don't think this will generate something, this, this approach will not bear fruit that uh, is going to uh, allow us to take this approach uh, to 
to practice. So fortunately, just like uh, uh, aerospace engineers can successfully build flying machines without understanding how birds fly, um, we, I believe that uh, we can also build practical AI without having to mimic how brain does it. That is, that is to say we can combine the strengths of symbolic and sub symbolic approach to build practical AI today without having to grow uh, intelligence out of neural networks. So this is actually, so how does this combination work? So if you, uh, at Juji, we basically did this by treating the symbolic system as a bone, basically the basic system as a framework. Whereas the data-driven approach, the components, deep learning, machine learning components as a flash. So symbolic system is chosen as a base system because it's uh, amicable for human inspection and the human intervention. So we can actually easily grow the system and, and adapt as the user requirement changes. Despite the fact that this kind of system is very rigid And on the other hand, the, the data-driven approach, like deep learning, machine learning modules, they are easier to develop because all you need is feed, feed them data and then tune some parameters. It's much easier to develop. Uh, and also they actually generalize better because you know, with diverse different uh, situations because the uh, degrading of performance actually is smooth because it's, you're not dealing with binary things. However, of course, we already started uh, talking about those components are black boxes. Um, so it's not human changeable. So we should use them as a, we should use them as black boxes right? because they are black boxes. So and so in, in the career world, basically we can use them as functions. So this is how actually Juji uh, was built uh, from high level. So we. Um, uh, the business users basically use a graphic user interface to create uh, or config, or we call them config, um, a chat. Of course, the first they have to select a template, and then they can change some options, uh, add some content. And all those configurations are stored in Postgres. And then a code generator takes those information and then generates uh, the wrap script, uh, the DSL we developed. And of course, the business user, if they like to do something customized, they can have an IDE, they can work with directly uh, with rep code. So the generated code and the, uh, all those uh, chat management information are stored in Datamic. And so when a user come in to, to start chat with one of the bot, so if this uh, happened, this bot doesn't happen to initiate it yet. Um, so if the script has not been compiled yet, uh, uh, the system will retrieve the script and compile it. So basically, the compiler basically is a state machine compiler. So we compile the uh, rep script into optimized uh, state machines. Of course, you, you can also need to handle other um, functions. And uh, one of those functions are the deep learning, machine learning uh, components. So all those, uh, is, uh, all those computation is actually handled is not currently. I would like to write in, uh, in Clojure, but the, uh, the Clojure ecosystem in this space is not there yet, so we are still mostly uh, using Python uh, for those computations, uh, machine learning and deep learning. So all those com uh, computation was distributed uh, via Kafka. So we have multiple TensorFlow instances which hand um, handle the computations. Uh, and then this web script runtime basically will uh, generate a boat for individual, basically each, each chat session will, will create a boat for it. So of course this boat has to be stateful, I have to remember what I talked before, so it's very stateful. So throughout the whole process, uh, you will select a uh, chat template. This template itself of course is written is in EDEM file. Uh, the user configurations, the did in the UI, is also in EDEM files. And the script itself actually are eaten. And so basically we, we turn one kind of eaten format into a different kind uh, format. And then even the, the script compiler also generates actually the, the results of compilation is also, the state machines are also represented as uh, data. 
So it's data all the, all the way. So this helps, kind of enable us to kind of develop individual component in, relatively independently, basically it's just the data in, data out, so it's very easy to test, very easy to develop. So let's look, dig into more kind of details of how this uh, language looks like. So the basic building blocks of this uh, um, rap language is, uh, we call them topics. Topic, you can basically think of them as a set of rules. So this is a first hello world topic. Um, so you have a name, topic can have a name, or you, you can have an anonymous topic if you so desire, if you have some one of topic. The topic can take arguments, just very, very similar in format uh, to, a, to a function. And here are, are rules. So rules basically uh, consist of some triggers. Basically, that's if statement. And then you have the action. You can think of it as a then statement. So that's basically production rule. Um, so here, uh, this uh, trigger, this is empty, meaning it's always going to be true. So, um, and so it will basically say hello world so proactively. So let's look at um, more details of the production rules. Um, so each rule actually is associated with uh, some follow-ups, uh, zero or, or more follow-up topics, invocations. So for example, in here, you have a rule which basically uh, try to find uh, any one of those possible tokens, like hello, hi, hi, howdy. Uh, if your user input contain any of those, it will be considered as a match. So this is kind of an alternative pattern. So the syntax of uh, the scale word of one, meaning okay, one of the, any one of those. If it contains any one of those, uh, this is going to be a match. So the, once this is matched, and then um, this is always considered fired, and this is the output is uh, nice to meet you. It's a string output. So this rule, once it's fired, and the, the, it's associated, so here we have one associated sub follow up topics which is called uh, talk about weather. Of course, this topic I already defined somewhere else, so you, um, where you can talk about uh, the weather. So this is kind of basic structure of, 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 of uh, uh, production rule. So of course, topics uh, are a collection of rules, and, uh, and also a topic can compose. So one topic can include other topics. So here we have example, uh, this is a greeting topic, so we have m many different cases, like you have greeting, make greetings in the morning, greet, make greetings in the evening, you will uh, say things differently. And uh, so all those are already written, like morning greetings, evening greetings, those are already written somewhere else, the, all you need to do is include them. And here it says include before, meaning that the rules in those topics will be tried before the rules in this particular topic. So this is how we compose topics together. Um, so let's look at a little bit about more details of what the patterns you can use in the in the triggers. So here, uh, the top, so basically patterns you can think of as state machines, so it's based on token-based instead of, so it's very similar to a regular expression, but the only difference is that instead of it's character-based, here we are, uh, the matches are token-based. So for example, in the first example, uh, I love uh, pizza. This pizza, this, uh, this kind of keyword meaning from, uh, this, there can be one or more tokens between love and pizza. So this is kind of a sequence pattern with a wild card. You can specify how many tokens it can be before, uh, between love and pizza. And also, this, those are all uh, uh, symbols meaning that uh, all those symbols will actually will do automatically do limitations, so that uh, you can say I love or loves or loved will all be matched, so limitation is automatic for those symbol-based uh, token uh, pattern. Here, you, of course, you can, you can list it, uh, uh, those patterns together. And so here you have this question mark symbol basically means just like a secret expression means uh, um, uh, zero or one token. And uh, you have a, uh, uh, this is a pizza and, and the bacon here, this, this means uh, you can have either one of the pizza or, or one of the bacon or, or both of them. 
So as you can see, you can specify not just one alternative, you can have multiple a range of alternatives. And you can also specify this uh, this user input have to start with something. For, from here, this user input have to start with i. And uh, this this is a stream pattern. What's the difference between the stream pattern versus other uh, the symbol based pattern is uh, in the stream pattern we don't do lemmatization. So basically, we don't do transform the form. But also, the only thing we does is do a case insensitive matches. If you really need the case sensitive matches, then you have you can use this uh, real regular expressions. Um, that can be done with a tag, so you can go to the documentation to see we have many, many different kind of patterns. So those all are very traditional kind of symbolic way of doing things. Um, so we also introduce, uh, as I mentioned, we integrate the machine learning based approach. So some of them are manifest as uh, tags, and some others uh, you can use uh, manifest as, as content class. The tags, basically, you, you already know some examples from here. You already know the dog. You want to match dog, but you want this dog to be a verb. So you basically annotate, okay, this dog has to be verb, verb, and to be a match. So for this kind of keywords, is use a placeholder for some kind of content class. From here, this uh, phrase, uh, MP, meaning, okay, and anything that is a uh, long phrase, uh, uh, she love any noun phrase will be a match. Of similarly, you can you can match organizations, uh, you can match uh, durations and others. So this is how basically we take the machine. Of course, all those tags are backed up by machine learning based models and NLP models. So and also for deep learning, as we already discussed the neural networks. Uh, they are universal function approximator, so <laughs> it should be used as a function. So anything else is yeah, just uh, abusing. So that's why we actually um, uh, use them as functions. So in this particular example, so this pattern actually is very in uh, in interesting in that is you can see actually we freely mix the pattern as the functions. So every function in a pattern is treated as a boolean. Okay, no matter what you return, we basically, basically use the sem clear semantics uh, is used as a boolean, and all those patterns are considered as all the, uh, added together within a pattern. So, for example, this particular pattern means uh, this user input has to comp con contain the word programming. In addition, this whole input should belong to the category of uh, self user self uh, intro, should be relevant to self introduction. So of course, this self intro relevance model is a deep learning, uh, is a machine learning model we trained. Um, so all you need to do is to, to, to specify okay, which model you want to use and, uh, and use this function called input in this category, question mark. And of course, you can specify a threshold, how much you, uh, how strongly you want this match to be. So, um, so here we specify 0.7, so that meaning okay, uh, it's okay to be, I need to be relaxed. So the input user input has to contain programming. At the same time, they have to, this whole in user input has to be talking about uh, self-introduction. So in that case, then uh, this, this rule is considered matched, and then they both will say, oh, you must be a smart person. Um, so if you look at, the, at the, uh, the, the topic, so topic consists of a bunch of rules, and each rule is basically is a and uh, boolean expression, so the, the topic, the whole topic you can consider as a, uh, it's kind of a disjunctive normal form. So basically it can match anything that you would like to match. So let's look at other uh, examples of how we use deep learning. Um, here we are using basically um, ten TensorFlow based sentence embedding to calculate the similarity uh, between the user input where some, with some so-called anchored sentences we have. So here you can make a, a list of sentences you would like them to, to be similar to uh, in this pattern, and you want the similarity score between the user input and one of, one of those uh, uh, sentences to be greater than point line, so you really want to be similar to any one of those. So this is how you can, you can, you can imagine, you can very easily write patterns by just give some examples. Um, 
so, so of course you have the tools of deep learning, so machine learning based models, now also you have the tools of kind of a regular expression type of uh, symbolic um, patterns. So what though you, uh, based on our experience, uh, normally you want to use uh, machine learning or deep learning based models to cover kind of a broad cases. For example, okay, the topic, okay, this is about uh, talking about self-introduction. So that's very high level uh, things. It's very hard to write, write all the possible patterns for that. But it's uh, with deep learning because it's just trained with a lot of data, so they have they can have produced very generalizable model for, for that. But the, the whatever, how, no matter how good your model are, you're always going to miss some cases, or you have wrongly classified some things. Um, so for those misses, um, you basically use symbolic approach to to fix bugs, to to pull a plug in those holes. So you. Of course, uh, another way to do it is, is you use this machine learning to cover the broad cases and then use this uh, pattern-based approach, a symbolic approach to kind of uh, refine them into very really specific cases because you don't have enough data to, for each specific case, but you do have, you know, some words, some patterns that should match in those cases. So here I give an example of uh, what, we call, what we call branched rules. So as you can see, this rule, um, so we have two parts, basically. So this, um, the top part is a kind of a top, ma top matches, which is entirely based on similarity. And once that is matches, and then we can further refine this matches. In addition to belong to this category, also you have to contain this word programming. If that's the case, you will say, oh, you must be a smart person. If, that, if it's a different case where people's input contains art, oh, you can say, oh, I enjoy it. Oh, I enjoy art too. So basically, you can make the conversation like as if you actually understand what they are saying. And uh, but you can always have a default. So if you none of those cases matches, you can always have a default. Oh, thank you for inter uh, for the introduction. So that's how you can actually can kind of a nimbly put a machine learning based approach and a symbolic approach together freely. And since we have this, well, you can even do much even better. So you can even, uh, a topic can be turned into a function and this function can be used in another pattern. So you can do recursion like this endlessly. Um, so actually, in fact, you can even create a topic on the fly because it's all just data. So a topic is just a list that you can, you can generate. And this, run, this whole runtime is also accessible during, you can call them in, in your script. So for example, here we just create a topic from a, uh, create a function from a topic we have written, I give it a name, and then you can just execute it to, to generate some kind of spe specific output. You can even do this on the fly. So the pain of most of the uh, developing a conversation system, a conversation agent, is actually how to manage this conversation flow. So uh, some, a lot of uh, companies have chatbots and uh, APIs. Uh, most of the, all of the tech uh, giant and IBM, uh, uh, Google, Microsoft, they all have uh, APIs to, to, for, to help you to understand the natural languages. But none, none of them provide uh, any tool to manage the conversation flow. Or very primitive tools, so it's very painful to develop those kind of uh, uh, conversation, manage the conversation. So this is what actually Juji actually does it for you because uh, this rep is a declarative language, language. Actually, you don't manage the conversation flow yourself. And all you need to do is to say, okay, this is this how you want to use a certain topic. You, do you want to use it as a kind of an agenda topic where this has to be done? And this part, on, on this on the boat is agenda. So the, basically, if it's on the boat agenda, the, the boat is basically trying to to do this, uh, to get it, get it done, and it's uh, very persistent. Or you, you can use it as a so-called adlib topic. Adlib topic basically will be tested for any of user input, meaning that uh, anytime you, for example, user may ask you on user relevant questions, sometimes the user even curse you or something. So all those kind of a user trying to test about how it does, those normally you want to put them into adlib topics where it always be tested. And so, of course, you want this topic is really specific. And also, you have to manage the state. You have to remember what I had said before and all those. And all those are mostly managed by the built-in topics that Juju's written um, based on our experience. And so those things you don't have to worry about. 
And of course, there are always cases where the bird cannot even handle, or you, you, you have a script error, you, your script actually <laughs> run into a loop or something like that. And those will have some topic called the exception topics. Those will handle those cases where you kind of <laughs> running into a dead end. So, so that uh, we can make sure this conversation always goes back to, to the right track. So all those are managed through a stack. Actually, it's very simple. It's a, a single stack, and uh, we just pu push the stack uh, topics around. So that's how we manage the conversation flow. Um, so, um, so in conclusion, uh, with this uh, symbolic plus data-driven approach, we, we think it's actually practical today to build AI, uh, which is practical. And you don't have to really understand how a uh, brain works to, to build something useful. Uh, I definitely is going to pass a <laughs> Turing test. So because I already said it's uh, pretty easy to pass a Turing test. But uh, um, the benefit of this, you can also, the both actually can do something useful, not just uh, talk with people, sounds like a human. That's not enough. Um, uh, for this, I think Clearia is a great choice um, for doing that because NISP uh, was uh, the, language of symbolic AI, I think it still is um, the language of symbolic AI, because you can do a lot of things that you cannot possibly be doing in other languages. And also, especially the data orientation of Clojure makes it very easy to, to integrate a symbolic approach and sub-symbolic approach. So that's uh, uh, the end of the talk. Uh, any questions?